Hello, everybody. Now we will review the seven principles of universal design. Before we get started, I want to recap on universal design. We've talked about it on and off. Universal design is design that is intended to be universally accept, um, accessible. And universal means, uh, when we talk about a universal language, we talk about a language that everybody can speak. Um, usually symbols, math. Um, so for design, we have universal design. And that means we're, we all have the goal to create a space that everybody can use equally. So, you know, thinking about people in wheelchairs or people with sight issues or there's different types of um, neuro, uh, you know, abilities or disabilities, different types of body sizes. <laughs> Um, you might have asthma, like there's a lot of different types of needs that people have in a space and it's hard to design a space that is, um, accessible to everybody. I think we've all been in a space where there wasn't a wheelchair ramp or the doors were exceptionally hard to open because they were so large and heavy. And so just like um, the graphic design principles and the interior design elements and principles, universal design has principles of its own. So the first principle is equitable use. The design is useful and marketable to people with diverse abilities. So here we see two different scenarios attempting to get onto a subway. Now, you know, what do you think about this? I, you know, maybe you have pushed a stroller. In fact, it was maybe 18 months ago that a, you know, mid twenties, a woman in her mid twenties in New York city was, um, trying to get back onto the subway to go home. And she had a stroller with her child and there was no elevator or ramp to get from the street level down to the subway level. And she actually tripped and fell because uh, she was trying to carry the stroller with her child in it, in addition to all of her other stuff. And she died. The child was fine, but the woman in her mid twenties, able-bodied woman um, died and all because she had no way to get down to the subway to make the train on time. Um, and so there's a lot of stress involved and stress is something we need to think of in terms of equity. Um, there's physical abilities, there's different scenarios even. And so we do see the stroller showing up here. It's totally possible for those little wheels to get stuck in that space between the actual subway and the landing. And so that could um, result in the stroller you know, tripping and going forward. It's a safety hazard regardless. And, you know, even if you're thinking about people wearing shoes that are not totally flat and maybe their heels, that's a safety hazard for that. And I'm really showing um, obvious examples where we would say, yeah, we can see that, we can relate to that. But these exist all over and we live in the world that they exist in. So we don't know any different and we don't recognize the difference because that's all we know. Um, I will take this time to, <laughs> or yeah, we listened to that story um, about the woman with the windshield wiper, you know, she, uh, in lecture one, I think what is interior design? It was a Ted talk, I think. And everybody had just accepted that was the way of life was that they had to open the window and use their arms to be as a windshield wiper. But she designed an actual device 
to wipe the windows without having to open the window. So until you have somebody that can see the problem and not accept that it's just the way of life, um, we exist in a world where we don't realize how things are accessible or not accessible. There is also flexibility in use. So um, basically there's a wide range of individual preferences and abilities. Here we see somebody um, sitting at a table that is adjustable and um, the seat has rollers on it. You can't see that part, but um, so this looks like a public building. We'll say it's a library. Um, they don't know who's going to be using that table and that computer from day to day. So they have an adjustable desk that can adjust to any height of the user. Um, there's also right and left-handed scissors. Um, another thing that is popular right now in um, office design is temperature. So we have, you know, in <laughs> sustainable design where temperature and other environmental factors are monitored um, but it results in a large part of the people in the building being uncomfortable maybe they're too cold you know there's different ages there's different stages of life different needs people just have their preferences and so what are they to do so think about how a person can have uh, their you know workspace flexible to them can they control the lighting and the temperature in their own space? As designers, that is something we need to consider and you know collaborate with others on. Here, the principle three is simple and intuitive use. So we've been going over this um, many times about how people just psychologically, you know, translate and interpret things. Um, the way that they do. And because of that, we, we have graphics that look a certain way because that's how people read them. Like the, you know, the transportation schedule that we looked at. So Ikea instructions, <laughs> believe it or not, are this longstanding example of simple and intuitive instructions that do not use words. You can look at them just in symbols and put your item together. I mean, theoretically. <laughs> um, and so in a lot of manuals and instructions are um, becoming more similar to the way that Ikea does it. Another example of simple and intuitive use is the iPhone. They study psychology and human behavior um, and language you know, technology abilities, and they tailor their iPhone design based on people's abilities and how they use space. And they do this because they watch, that sounds creepy, but <laughs> they, they watch people just like I advise you when you're out in the public realm, watch people and observe them and see how they're using these graphic design cues. Are they successful? Are they not? That is going to inform how you might redesign it. Apple does this, the same thing. Then there's perceptible information. So again, this is um, using, this is a perfect example of environmental graphic design. So it's using things like color and symbols, but in a large spatial sense, um, so that people without even thinking can interpret this. So on the right hand side, Without reading the text, look at the picture. Is there anything that stands out in the picture? If you notice where the doors are for the trains, there are lights on the ground. And so it easily, if you're running, um, instead of <clears throat> like only relying on the signs overhead, you can see the light. And even if you were blind, you can see the contrast. And so it really helps people just naturally know where to get on to the train, but also where not to get onto the train. And naturally people will organize themselves around those lights instead of just clusters of people all over. 
so it creates um spatial order <clears throat> and then they've also used um, colors and symbols to indicate where the stops are and what stop it is um this is not you know a avant-garde idea this is not innovative um this is just a very very simple um thing that designers can do and surprisingly many don't and many don't think about these things because they design them the way that is easy for that them to read themselves um but m maybe not for everybody and then there's tolerance for error so of course the undo button obviously i think that just explains what tolerance for error means <laughs> without reading the definition. On the right hand side in the picture, what you see are is um, an inside and an outside separated by a curtain wall, which is a wall of windows essentially from floor to ceiling that have some kind of metal um, mullion to trim. And we see that this is a door um, or, you know, a window that opens up wherever there is, um, any type of opening in a building, it's guaranteed that that is going to be a source where hot air is going to get in or leak out, uh, depending on the seasons, you know, there's going to be a draft might have water. So thinking about how you can control those scenarios, you know, we're, it's going to happen anyway. You're, there's no way to have design like if you're going to open a door it's going to let in cold air <laughs> that's just the way it is um and i say that as i just said you know think about life other than that's just the way it is but so here's here's a solution until one of you comes up with a design that solves this problem here's the solution Maybe it's, maybe it's all doors need to come in from underground or something. So they're not even exposed to the outside. And a lot of this is why we have vestibules because that takes, um, all of that unconditioned air. But here we have some grates. Um, and what this is, this is allowing hot air. I'm assuming it's cold outside in this scenario. So it's allowing heat, um, to come out. So when these are open and that cold air comes in, that heat automatically hits it. Um, so air moves from hot to cold and it's going to, that heat is going to um, get to that cold air and neutralize it before it can get past these grates. Um, so start looking, when you go to buildings, start looking where the sources of the heat or air conditioning are located. And um, not all buildings use this style um pretty much newer buildings that are being built right now do but you'll you'll notice and if you go into a building notice how you feel in those spaces and a lot of the times when you do walk into a building and there is the strip of we'll say hot air you walk into it and it lets you know that you're inside principle six is low physical effort um so you if you are selling something and somebody in a wheelchair is going to drop thousands of dollars on your product, you don't want them to leave the store disgruntled because they couldn't get their wheelchair to the checkout counter. Um, iPads and mobile um, transaction devices have solved that problem. Um, well, not completely solved it. We still have the spatial aspects they just are a band-aid for it um but thinking about things of how can people get around so on the right hand side um these atms you see that they have a little bit of an angle there's a ledge and an angle that fits the standard um size of a person rolling in would also um for any type of children or anything this provides a ledge you can even see um, in the background, there's some wayfinding there as well. And then on the left-hand side, you're seeing just people use their phones. Um, phones are a great way of explaining how and why low physical effort in achieving daily tasks is 
a great idea. So if we had low physical effort, I'm not sure if that woman in the New York subway would have died because she would have had a way to get transportation um, accessibly for her. And then we have principle seven, size and space for approach and use. Um, so in this bus that you see on the right, um, there are different seating scenarios. So if you're, you know, just a couple, there's a place for you to sit. If you're have different, if you have a walker or a family or a stroller or a wheelchair, there's space for you there as well. It's all been thought of and the aisles are wide enough actually by arranging the chairs facing each other, like the ones we're seeing, it has taken the, um, the width into the aisle way that two chairs would have had. And now we have one, so there's more space. And it's very similar on the um, left-hand side. It's showcasing how those easy passways where you scan your card um, can be more accessible for different sizes and approaches. And in this case, it's super wide and there's no more of those like bars that you have to push and roll your way through. So those are the basic um, seven principles. There are a lot of efforts and elements and design ideas that uh, you know will take the inspiration of one of these things and you know, innovate the industry. And so when you're out in the field and you're looking around at the graphic design um, elements, look for any of these and see if they relate to one another. Um, and if they do include it in your write-up, if they don't include that too, if things satisfy it, it's equal. If things don't satisfy it, it's all about you noticing either way in the space. So that is all for this. And I will talk to you guys later. Goodbye.